All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you all to Arizona History Happy Hour. So thank you all so much for being here. We have a great night. And let's see. Let's talk. So again, welcome everyone. This is episode 19 that we've been doing of the Arizona History Happy Hour. And each week we have so much fun getting a chance to just talk and learn about the amazing place that we all like to call Arizona. And I know I call home. I've been here for 20 years, but we'll get into that in a little bit. And we've got so much fun. But you know, this is only made possible through folks like you donating whatever you can. Anything is appreciated. We also have a sponsor in AARP, Arizona, and they like to say the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we are not alone. AARP is here in Arizona providing information that can help you and your family. You can find out about some of their virtual programming that they have online as well as other services. You can go to their website, which is www.aarp.org slash AZ for Arizona. So you can reach out to them and they will have all kinds of great stuff for you. And you know, one of the really cool things that just happened. So last week they actually had a spot on channel 15 and they were talking about like the drum circle they're doing, some of the other virtual programming they're doing that comes right to your living room. And they featured Marshall Shore Hip Historian doing Arizona History Happy Hour. So thank you. Um, hopefully some of you also may be joining us from that, seeing that for the first time. So now also you'll notice that we can also, if you see a chat panel on the side, you are welcome to communicate via that way. You can send little notes and we'll get into more about what you can do with that in just a little bit. Also, I'd like to say if you are using this on Facebook, you know, they recently went to this new format and it's kind of wonky. So if you could do me a big favor and just click that share button and let everybody know how much fun you're having as we get a chance to learn about Arizona and taking a look in different ways about what's going on. I would very much appreciate that. So also, if you'd like to reach out after the show, you can always throw a note out to me on Facebook, and that is Marshall Shore, Hip Historian. Also, if you're on Instagram, Hip Historian, or even good old fashioned email, and that is hello at hiphistorian.com. And I'm happy to say as of today, now it's a work in progress, but I have a new website that I just went live with, um, let's see, at seven, at about 2.30 this afternoon, I made the switch. And so it's no longer about 2005 technology. Hopefully it's a little bit better and hopefully more improvements coming down the road as we get there. And so we've got some great fun for you this evening. So we'll have our trivia with our special guest, Peggy Fiendaka, as well as looking at Arizona music. And we'll be looking at Lee Crow, an Arizona native, as well as Little Arizona. And we'll be taking a look at a little town right on the border, just outside of Bisbee. Some of you may have been there before. And also that's, so this is an homage to that, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, the little town of Naco. I mean, I try to, in this segment, focus on towns that are a thousand folks or less. And so there's so many amazing towns outside of the big city or the fifth largest city in the country. I mean, I think some of the magic of Arizona is also just some of those little bergs. So my name is Marshall Shore. I'm also known as the Hip Historian. Now you might wonder, how does one get a name like the Hip Historian? Well, you know, a little over 20 years ago, um, I was living in Brooklyn and I was actually working in a library. Now, let's make that bigger because I really, this was such a beautiful library. 
I used to work in this library, which is Arlington, which was an old Carnegie building. And so I left that and you can kind of see in front of that, there's a little bit of snow. It probably was just after the first snow and it kind of melted. And so, you know, realized it was time for a change and indeed it was a change. So loaded everything we own into a big orange cube, a U-Haul. And you know, they have their international world headquarters right here in the Valley of the Sun. And so when we got to Arizona, pretty much moved right into a little 1956 ranch. Now, when we moved in, it was beige on beige on beige. I'm happy to say now that it is a lovely two-tone of seafoam and cantaloupe. And there's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, the matching stovetop, the push buttons inset in the wall. And if you look, the oven is that 1956 brand new for GE General Electric, because electric living is good living. Now, if you look at that oven, you'll notice a big difference between yours and the one that's in my kitchen. The biggest difference you'll notice is the fact that there is no window. So if I wanna take a look at what's in my oven, I've got to so carefully open, but even more gingerly shut that door because if I let it slam, my cake falls. And no one wants a fallen cake. I mean, you'll still eat it, but it's not the best it could be. Now, as soon as I moved here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history here. But I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, I came face to face with so much amazing history. And then there's that post-war boom that I think in a lot of ways helped form the Arizona that we all know and love today. All those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on their way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers. And in some cases, looking for a home just like mine. Now, if you feel like you're on the surface of the sun, that's because it's summer in Arizona. In fact, I think there's even some humidity out there. So it's even that much more delightful, shall we say. And you know, how do we all survive? How do we all stay as cute and cool as these penguins? Why, it is thanks to this man, Dr. Carrier, the inventor of air conditioning. I would also like to reach out and say thank you to Phoenix New Times. They have named me best historian several years in a row, as well as Phoenix Magazine named me the best bespectacled Phoenix celebrity because I do indeed like my eyewear. Now, oh, and you know, I am a complete futz. All right, so I, <laughs> I set something up and now it's not set up, but all right, so we will change that. All right. So, you know, I've kind of developed my own sense of style my own sense of storytelling and all kinds of things. So I figured I'd change it up a little bit and show off some of the things that are actually sitting in my closet. So several years ago, I had a friend, Mary Lucking, who put together an event out in Scottsdale. And let's make that a little bigger. And so the event was called Picnic with a Fish. It was really a moment to celebrate those they're white amber, these fish that live in the canals. And they eat their body weight in algae a day. And so when they go to repair canals, they actually have to move them. And so decided to take that opportunity to actually celebrate these fish. And so they did an event where you could actually, they had them in tanks around and you could enjoy the fish. We did it out in Scottsdale, down by the Slurry Bridge. And so it was funny because they were going through a line of folks and 
everybody was getting a t-shirt for the event. And when they got to me, they were like, you don't wear t-shirts, do you? And I was like, to the gym, that's about it. And so when they said, well, what do you want? I said, I want a suit coat. And they were like, it's going to be summer. I'm like, it'll be lightweight cotton. So there you go. And so they made me this really cool special jacket that has these, I mean, on the pockets, on the front, but even better. I don't know if you can see it, but it's got these, re these really huge fish on the back there. Let's try that and see if. So, yeah. So it's like, I love the fact that I have this suit coat and I can wear it for different occasions. I realized I probably should have worn it um, when we had Dan from SRP on, but you know, I didn't think about that. So, but anyway, now back to the regular. Now I'm back to our regularly scheduled program. So what am I wearing now? So the suit coat I'm wearing now actually was created for me by a local artist, just like the other one. But this was the genesis, that nugget of that idea. And so it was painted for a centennial. Because, you know, every February 14th, we have a big celebration for ourselves. And... With that celebration, in 2012, we had a whiz-bang of one for 100 years of statehood. And so I knew it needed to be something special. And so I was like, well, what does that look like? And, you know, someone gave me 15 minutes on the main stage in front of the state capitol on that February 14th of 2012. So even more pressure to make something spectacular. So the hunt was on what to do. So, you know, as your mind starts worrying around, I was like, you know, I want to talk about an event that not a lot of people remember from Arizona's past. It was started back in 1926 by Charlotte Hall. Now, she was a poet as well as her house up in Prescott has now been turned into a museum. Now, it was also home to Terrell Governors before her, but I love how they preserved that house and have expanded. The event was called Mask of the Yellow Moon. It was right up there, touted by national magazines as something that everyone in the country should come and see. And lots of people did. It was first held at the Elbridge River Shriners Temple, which was right down the street from the Capitol. It still stands and became the Mining and Mineral Museum, but they got kicked out for something that never happened, but happy to say they will be moving back in in the next few years under University of Arizona. They have to kind of bring the building back up to code, but happy to see another quirky museum returning. So from there, it then went to Montgomery Stadium, which was our first stadium here in Arizona and had many different events. In fact, it was known for this event called MAP. It was known for something called the Salad Bowl, which was our very first bowl game. And here you can see them practicing out on the field, those marching bands. And now, circa the late 80s, what it now looks like, the fact that there is nothing there well, there's not, not nothing there, but is now ASU Preparatory. It is their sports field. And not that amazing stadium. But, you know, what would you expect from something called the Salad Bowl? Why none other than a parade with a queen of the Salad Bowl riding in her very own Salad Bowl. And if you look really close you'll notice that there is even a spoon and fork for her to serve from. So the Massey of Elamun, what was it? So the theme of it was, it was about a legend about how the God of the Sun would give his rays to make the earth golden and warm and make things grow. So it was always held in the springtime 
And at its height, it had about 8,000 high school and college students performing, presenting, involved with it. It was a huge undertaking. It was over the entire curriculum of the high school. So you had a variety of groups doing things like you had the debate club doing skits. You had multiple marching bands in front of really large sets, as well as a field full of young dancing ladies. Now they were all costumed up. And so all those costumes were designed by students and made by home ec. And I was lucky enough to find a couple of those dresses in a box. And so the hunt was on. So I had dresses. I just needed models. So I was able to talk to three of my friends into donning these amazing dresses. Now, all these dresses are from the late 30s. And that is why I needed something that would stand up to those dresses. So I talked to my friend, Glenn. Now, Glenn is in his early 90s now, but in the 50s, when he rolled into town, he was a sign designer. And he pretty much hit the ground running. In fact, one of the first signs he worked on was actually one of the first signs I fell in love with, and that would be the Buckhorn Baz. You know, let's make that a little bigger just because it's such a spectacular sign. It is out in Mesa, almost to Apache Junction. And as well, it's still standing. The building is still there. It shut down a little over 20 years ago. And so the company that now currently owns it is talking about preserving. So hopefully that does come to fruition as things move forward. And so the jacket that he created was really an homage to the Arizona state flag. And so then I realized, well, you know, why just have that one suit coat? One artist created suit coat on one theme when I could have more. And so right now I've got several different suit coats made by a variety of artists and actually chatting with folks about the next few. So looking forward to that, and that should be fun. Now, one of the reasons why I always like to start with this story is, is because you never know where the next part of the story is coming from. People have been my best source of stories, information. And so this dress has really special meaning. So I did a program for the first film of Arizona. When I was done, a woman tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, let's go out to my car. Now I should tell you about the first of Arizona. In order to belong to that group, you have to be able to prove your family lineage, your history back to pre-statehood, back to before 1912. So it's an amazing group of folks to talk to. And so she pulled this dress out of her car and it was her mother's dress from the Mask of the Yellow Moon. But it gets even better because she had programs with it. Now, those programs were 1928 and 29. And now at that point, the librarian me kicked in. I didn't have gloves, so I didn't feel like I could like touch the paper. So I look forward to getting another chance to take a look at that and seeing exactly what year that dress was worn in. Now, for something from the late 20s, it's an amazing condition. And so I look forward to finding out exactly what number and what year that dress was worn in. And also, I'd like to say that the First Families of Arizona is now a proud sponsor of Arizona History Happy Hour. If you'd like to find out more information about them, you can track them down on Facebook or their website is TFFOA for First Families of Arizona.org. And you can find out more information about them. I know they're doing some virtual programming, and I've had several guests who didn't realize they were eligible to be members. So thank you so much. And of course, because it is happy hour, we have a cocktail. And now I love the fact that PJ reached out and said, you know, let's start doing some really fun things. 
So the Valley Ho has really stepped up their game. And so what we are doing is they are creating these weekly cocktails that you can get to go from them. But you know, it's like, so things like this week, I don't even call it a cocktail to go. It's more of a cocktail kit because it's something that you don't just walk in the door. It's not like a Capri Sun or something where you just like jam the straw in and you can drink. That's the fun of it, is it takes a little bit of time. And so, let's see if we can, all right. So you'll see there is my kit. And so, so basically PJ created the City Boy Sour because Congress has now designated two days as National Whiskey Sour Day. We're kind of right in the middle of that. So it's the 25th and the 29th. And the red float is actually um, what makes it a sour, but it also plays into the fact that our special guest this evening, Peggy, will have, has some wine history. So, hmm, and I don't think I can do anything about you guys looking at my back. So, all right. So let's see what is in our cocktail kit today. I mean, and the pictures that he sent me of this are fantastic. I hope I do it justice. All right. So first off, what I think is really cool is we have foam. So we get to make our own foam to put on top of the cocktail. And look at that. It frosts right up just like it's supposed to. Don't you love it when things work like they're supposed to? All right, so now that we've got that, let's go ahead and put that into our glass. All right, and then we have our foam on top. And then just and there we go. But then that's not it because it's also kind of an homage to New York City. There is a lovely apple slice that goes on top of it. So, and there we go. We have our cocktail with a little bit of a little drizzle of red wine. Mm. Oh, oh, PJ, you outdid yourself. All right. So, you know, we always have fun. And, you know, and our guest tonight has had a heck of a week. I know she was recently had to come back. <laughs> I like the person's like, oh, this is a strong drink this week. Yeah, but it's so darn tasty. All right, so hold on, having a little bit of a technical difficulty.
Sorry about this, but you know, sometimes with this technology, things don't go quite the way you planned. All right. And then sometimes they go just as you had planned. So, <laughs> oh gosh. So, oh, and actually, hold on just a moment. Let me. Ba -ba -da -ba. So, and I do, so, you know, okay. So you saw my version of the cocktail. Here is the cocktail that JP made. A little bit prettier than mine, but you know, I love the fact that I was able to do this from home, which I think is really cool that I made this rep from my own home. And so again, thank you so much, PJ, for that cocktail kit that allowed me to create that City Boy Sour. And we've already started talking about what next week is, so that's going to be really exciting. Now, I do have a little bit from our Histocam. So, one the, so as I do these, one of the fun things is getting to talk about some of those towns. So what I'm going to do is, let's see, actually, we're just going to hold it up here. So one of my things, so with libraries being closed, I was like, what the heck am I gonna do? Because one of my favorite books I had no access to. And so I just got a copy of Arizona Place Names, which we'll be actually using later this evening when we talk about NACO, Arizona and how it gets named. It's really a fun book to use. Now, through the miracle of modern technology, this is what it looked like in 1964, which may actually be what we go to more, is we actually have a space designated for video conferencing calls. I'm happy to welcome my friend Peggy. Hi, Marshall. I am so happy you are here. Oh my gosh, what a week you've had. I'm sure stories will come out about that, but well, but you know, I know you're the owner and brand manager of the LD, LDV Winery. Yes. But prior to planting grapes, you had your fingers in so much Arizona soil. And I sure did. I mean, you served as the committee planning manager for the state of Arizona Department of Commerce, serving under five governors, Babbitt, Mika, Mofford, Symington, Hall, as community planner, planning manager, with technical assistance to communities, <laughs> primarily in those rural areas, in planning, zoning, economic, and community development. And I know you also had your own company, Partners for Strategic Action, since 92. And thank you so much for being here because I know you've had one heck. <laughs> so thank you so much for running all over the state, making, making your magic happen. So Absolutely. How, and I know you actually had a cooking show earlier today. Sure did. Yep. It was so great. What, what did you make? We made a, uh, it was all about cheese and wine, and we made shrimp beurre blanc sauce. It uh, was awesome with Gruyere cheese and a brie starter, and we, um, what else did we do? We did another dish, and I already forgotten. That's how I switched to planning from cooking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they're both big planning. Yes, exactly. They do. <laughs> I got my cocktail here, some some great LDV wine. So, so what are you drinking there? I am drinking a 2017 Viognier. It's a, one of our, it's the only white grape that we grow, and it's just really yummy for the summertime. Nice. Uh, and I saw that you have a whiskey sour. Yeah, that actually has a little drizzle of red wine, because when I was talking to PJ, I said, well, you know, Peggy's got some wine, wine in her blood. So he did a special thing. And so that made it a New York sour just for you. I Perfect. thought, he, and so I actually thought it was kind of funny because I thought he was going down the road of Jane Jacobs, who's from ah. New York as, and was big in urban planning as well. And Absolutely. so I love how it was kind of like, it's like we both had different ideas, but they kind of merged together without even knowing it. So, I love it. I love the fact that you know Jane Jacobs. Oh my God. I mean, Jane's walk. I mean, you know, we did that for a while here in Phoenix. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't know if we did it last year or not, 
but yeah, doing walks across the city. Love it. And just to introduce people to preservation and kind of what's going on, or in some cases, what's not going on. That's that's fabulous. I, it's so important that we pre preserve the heritage of our cities. Indeed it is. So now every week we do trivia and I have the guests create trivia. So that way they get to share some amazing stories. And so unlike your normal trivia, if you play trivia in a bar where you literally just go in and answer the questions and walk out, we actually take the time to go through all the answers and tell some stories. And I have a feeling there's be some really good stories coming out of this one. <laughs> So I, I think before we start, could you just tell us what urban planning is? Oh, great question. Because, you know, when I started college, I wanted to be an architect and I didn't get accepted into the College of Arch Architecture. And I was trying to figure out what the heck am I going to do with my career if I'm not going to be an architect? And in the College of Architecture at ASU, there was this program called urban planning. It's like, Okay, what the heck is that? And I went ahead and signed up for that. Thank goodness, because my I would have been a horrible architect. And so how I describe urban planning is architects build the buildings, planners plan all the spaces between all the buildings and make sure that the, the, um, the buildings and the interaction of buildings with the open space and the transportation and infrastructure work all together urban planning kind of takes that into consideration. You know, I used to love um, when Pearl was downtown and they had that that basically that model of the city, that scaled model where they could go put buildings in and see what the yeah. sun looked like at different times. So it was always fun to go in and just kind of see that. Right, it, it is the interaction of, of in the environment um, interacting with the buildings and the infrastructure, the transportation. Uh, my focus is on comprehensive planning and long range planning. So I don't deal with, I deal with the here and now. I always look 20, 30, 40 years out and try to help cities plan for that long term vision. Ah, and that's so important now, that long term vision instead of just looking at the here and now. Right, so. exactly. All right, so as we get ready to do some trivia, you can keep track of it on your phone. You can, if you've got a pad of paper next to use that. Um, some people will be using the chat sash, the chat boxes. So whatever you feel comfortable, you go right ahead and do that. And so we are gonna start with some trivia. I hope it would help actually if you could see the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta click on the right buttons to make things happen. Who knew? <laughs> All right. So question number one, what U.S. movement influenced modern community planning? A, public health, B, city beautiful, C, city functional, or D, environmental? What one of those movements influenced modern community planning? And Marshall, this is kind of a tough question um, and kind of a tricky question for everyone. <laughs> oh, people are used to that by now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, the planning profession really dates back to the 1800s. And each one of these movements really influence uh, modern day planning and as well as others. And it kind of through history, each one of these began to help frame the planning profession. I mean, when you think back in the late 1800s and, and the early 1900s, when you think about the cities at that particular time, there were a lot of public health issues, the industrial um, uh, uh, environment for workers were really difficult and the need to begin to put together some housing standards all started to come into play in the early 18 or the late 1800s. So that public health movement was very critical. And then when you see in the late 1800s, um, the City Beautiful movement was really like 1893, 1894, when people were starting to think about open space and the importance of getting average citizens involved in planning their cities. And so the idea of a planning commission 
was actually came into play that early or late in, in the 1800s. And then when you think about the 1940s um, and the kind of military and this whole concept of form uh, follows function. And so you began to see cities really developing in that way. And then in the 70s, the whole environmental movement. So you, you got this concept of people thinking about wildlife and open space and how do we conserve our natural resources and how do we embed those or begin to develop those as part of cities. So that's why it's a kind of a trick, trivia questions, because all four of those are critical to um, how we think about planning today. <laughs> I know. And it was so funny. So you were like, oh, should I rewrite the question? I'm like, no, because they're all important. So we should talk about all of them. So, yes, exactly. So, so this is the freebie for everybody. So yes, it doesn't matter what you put, you're going to get this one right. So <laughs> now remember, everybody, we're going to basically go through all the questions and then take a little bit of an Arizona music break. And then we will talk about all the answers. So just be ready for that because there's, I, this one was shocking, but so, okay. So question two, planning in Arizona was authorized in what year? A, 1909, B, 1928, C, 1973, or D, 1999. So what year was planning authorized in Arizona. And we'll go through those answers once we get to the end and take our little bit of a break so that way everybody can rally their answers and see how well you do. All right, so question three. Which of these, plan which of these major planning initiatives shaped Arizona growth the most? A, Salt River Project. B, Arizona Comprehensive Transportation System Plan. And look at that year for a Comprehensive Transportation System Plan, 1960. Or was it C, Groundwater Management Act? Or D, Urban Lands Act? So which one of those do you think was the major event pl for planning that helped shape Arizona growth the most? All right, as we mosey on to question four, what town in Arizona surrounded by an Indian community annexed land 13 miles away that's not connected to the original town? A, Swaharita, B, Gila Bend, C, Parker, or D, William? So which one of those communities annexed land 13 miles away from a Native American community. All right. As we're hitting that halfway point, what was the last county to be established in Arizona? A, was it Gila County? Was it B, La Paz? C, Yuma? Or D, Yavapai? Which one of those do you think was the very last county to be established in Arizona? Which state route in Arizona has the most roundabouts identified by designs, um, identified, designed by citizens, and in some cases, probably cursed by citizens? <laughs> but, all right, so is it State Road 89, A, or is it B, State Road 179? or C, State Road 69, or D, State Road 260? Which one of those has the most roundabouts? Designed by citizens. Which Arizona community became known as the prison city and then focused its planning and strategy around that theme? Was it A, Buckeye, B, Yuma, C, Florence, or D, Coolidge. Which one of those communities became known as Prison City? And that kind of pushed how they planned and strategized for their future. Which was Arizona's first planned community? A, Prescott. 
B, Clarkdale, C, Youngtown, or D, Arizona City? Which one of those was the first master plan community? And we're in the home stretch here, only two more to go. Arizona is home to two of the largest municipal parks in the country. Where are those located? A, Tucson and Phoenix, B, Chandler and Scottsdale, C, Phoenix and Scottsdale, or D, Mesa and Buckeye. So what communities in Arizona have some of the largest parks in the country? And then our last question, who is Arizona's most famous community planner? A, Governor Bruce Babbitt, B, Frank Lloyd Wright, C, Paula Solari, or D, our guest Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> I love she put herself it's in. Me. <laughs> exactly. All right. So while you're all kind of catching up and figuring out your answers, we're going to take a little bit of an Arizona music break. And so we're going to have a chance to talk about um, an Arizona native, Lee Crow. Lee Crow's dad was also one of the courtroom artists for the Don Bowles case and actually won awards for some of his art. Now, one Halloween in the late 80s, she dressed up as Elvis Presley. And, you know, before the next year, she was living in San Francisco as and performing across the country as Elvis herself, the first female impersonator sanctioned by Graceland. And so she would travel the country, but she got into a little tussle in one space when there was one of the Presley family members scheduled to be at an event and they didn't like that there was a female Elvis impersonator. So they basically withdrew her sanction. And so then she went rogue. And so she is part of a band called Velveta. And they did a band, they have a song they just released earlier this month all about the ballad of the the lost Dutchman mine. And let's see, I think we can hear a little bit of So that is a fresh new song just out, um, not even 30 days yet. If you'd like to track them down, you can find that on Bandcamp. They had several different L um, EPs out. Um, this one is called Rhymes with Loretta, hence the name Velveta. And so that's our kind of a little dip into some Arizona history for music. All right, so who is ready for some answers? Because, you know, this is where we start having all the fun. <laughs> all right, so we kind of talked about a little bit that what U.S. movement influenced modern community planning? All of them. All of them, because they're all so important. You know, my first thought when I saw this session was City Beautiful because of the scuffle they had in Tucson with all the signs. Ah, yes. And so that was why, that's one of the reasons why we have so few of some of the neon things that we've had around forever because mm -hmm. they suddenly said, oh, signs are too much clutter. We've got to get rid of them. Right, right. That's always been an issue in the planning profession and, and the whole concept of about signage and w what can be on signs, where they can be located. It's, it's been a tricky, tricky issue. 
Yeah, and I love that you've got um, Tucson has become such a um, a hotbed of neon preservation. I'm actually right. one of our guests coming up in the next few months is going to be the Ignite Sign Museum down in Tucson. So excited! Awesome. About that. Yeah. All right. And planning in what year was it authorized in Arizona? 73. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that um, in, in the, across the country, planning, we got the ability to do community planning in 1928. But Arizona didn't start to think about planning until a law was passed called the Urban Environment Management Act in 1973, which allowed communities to actually develop a plan and begin thinking longer term about the development in their community. Really late for cities. Yeah, I was, I was honestly surprised it was so late that we started getting into it. Yeah, absolutely. But we've caught up. We've done good. a lot. Good. That's good to hear because I was wondering, I was like, well, wow, wow, you know, with all that ground to make up, did we? But I'm sure under your watch, we did indeed. Yeah, it's it's been a fun ride. All right. So then question three, which of these minor planning and major planning initiatives shaped Arizona growth? This is a tricky one, too. I'm sorry. I love to throw those in there. <laughs> and, I, and I couldn't say no because they're all so important. They are all so important. So I guess it all depends on what your perspective is and where you come from. Obviously, when um, the Salt River Water Association was formed in 1903, which was, we were a leader in the country, the first in the country to have such an association to begin to think about planning in the Salt River Valley and putting that project together to manage begin to deliver water to the valley in 1970 was pretty pretty innovative um, but you know the transportation system that we have in this state is dates back to 1960 where they really did do a comprehensive long-range transportation plan that put in place many of the roads that we have today so that's important and then obviously the groundwater management act is critical because it it establishes some water management areas that um, begin to, what it did was really get us thinking about land use and water and do we have adequate water supply? And that was something that Governor Babbitt really uh, provided some guidance on as well as the Urban Lands Act. You know, the that goes back to statehood, the fact that we have these, urb, these lands, state lands and what that act did Governor Babbitt passed was uh, provide a framework for how we take a look at those lands, how we plan for them for the highest and best use to the 13 um, beneficiaries of the land trust, the largest one being the educational land trust. So how do you respond to folks, especially with the fact that even in this time, there are so many people now moving to Arizona from elsewhere? And I know that question comes up a lot is, is there enough water? Yes, um, you know, not necessarily where people want to live. <laughs> 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 you know, part of, part of the water issue is getting the water to the places where people want to live and, and develop. And no, we have to do, we've done well with water management. We have to continue to do a lot more. Um, we were leaders with doing long range planning for um, groundwater management in 1980. Um, there really needs to be a, the next round of that long range planning for this state. So we, we are protected in terms of water. Very good. All right. What town in Arizona surrounded by a native, an Indian community annexed land 13 miles away that's not connected to the original town? Yeah, this is a, this was one of my projects. Very fun project. Um, uh, we had to get special legislation in 1980 to allow the city town of Parker to annex land that was not contiguous to the original town site. Um, problems with the Parker, when the federal government divvied up uh, reservations, the Colorado River Indian community and the town of Parker, it's really a checkerboard of 
ownership between uh, native lands and city-owned lands, and it's very difficult to provide infrastructure and services. So the town of Parker, for economic development reasons, needed to have a chunk of land that they could really develop so, so they become more sustainable. And they found a piece of land 13 miles away. And so they're their only city or town in the state of Arizona that has um, land that's non-contiguous to their original town site. But it is a beautiful site. If you haven't been to Parker, yeah. it's, it's a gorgeous place to go hang out. Yes, the Colorado River is gorgeous. Yeah. What was the last county to be established in Arizona? B. La Paz County. It, um, when you think about counties, we only have 15 in Arizona, which is so unusual compared to other states. And La Paz County is in, was in northern, basically Yuma County for a very long time. And, and totally different kinds of dynamics and people and politics in the, the north and the south of Yuma County at the time. And so it was very controversial. And they didn't, La Paz County or people in the northern part of what was Yuma County felt like they weren't getting representation. And so they enacted legislation in 1983 that allowed them to split off from Yuma County and become our 15th county. So I had no idea it was that late. Yeah, it was that late. So that was the last of our 15 counties that we had in Arizona established. Most of, the, well, four of the counties were formed right about the time, um, 1862, when we became a territory. Uh, but La Paz was the last one in so far. Wow. Very fun project to work on. <laughs> I can only imagine. I mean, it's so surprising when you think of counties, you think, oh, they were done during statehood early no. on. Wow. You know, there's a process in state law that allows counties to be formed. So uh, it's hard. It's hard to do. But uh, La Paz County was able to do it. Wow. What are the benefits of becoming your own county? Well, you know, like in that in La Paz County situation, they were so different. They felt from Yuma and they didn't have um, good representation. So it allows you to establish your own elected board of supervisors, create your own rules that are specific to your particular part of the county and, and, and self-governance, basically. Okay, and really so it gives you a voice then in what's going on in Correct. your home place. Oh, interesting. Correct. All yeah. right. And which state route has in Arizona the most roundabouts identified designed by citizens? You know, this was, again, one of my projects that I worked on, very controversial. Um, ADOT at the time was trying to address State Routes 179 issues, and they were talking about a limited access freeway to go from uh, I-17 into uh, Sedona. And people were so up in arms. They yeah. wanted to would destroy the views, destroy the environment through there. And they, I mean, they were tying themselves to bulldozers just about, but to Arizona Department of Transportation's credit, they chose to step back and say, okay, we'll help you citizens of the area design a roadway that fits within the, the values of this region and helps uh, protect the environment. And so we went through a two year long um, what we call the needs-based implementation planning process with hundreds of citizen meetings where we basically taught them all about transportation engineering and they evaluated um, different solutions and actually came up with the solutions of the roundabouts throughout that region. And um, it's improved the safety of that road. Uh, it, the traffic's there. And a lot of people use it, but fascinating project, one of a kind in the country, um, but it's very successful in a lot of ways and a fun project to be a part of. Well, you're right. And it really does, I think, improve safety as well as that environmental issue mm -hmm. of just the, the, the views. I mean, exactly. would have. I mean, it's like 
nobody would even see those views anymore. And now you actually get to see them still. Yeah. A roundabout is very safe from a traditional intersection. You're not going to get killed uh, in a roundabout, most likely. Um, you can't get T-boned, which uh, you do in an intersection. And so it might slow it down, but it keeps the traffic moving. Right. All right, N7. Which Arizona community became known as Prison City? You know, this was, again, one of my projects. And... Um, you know, I loved working for Governor Rose Mofford. I think she is just a, a gem of oh, Arizona. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, we could sure use her in office right now. Right. And um, in 1989, in her State of the State address, she said that I want to make Florence, focus on Florence as where we locate all of the prisons um, to address the, the issues and locate them in Florence. And I got to work with Governor Moffitt on making that happen, doing a study that said, how do we make this happen and make it successful? And just a side fun story. If you know Governor Moffitt, she could tell a story like no other. And she could tell a dirty joke like no other. <laughs> Are you going to tell us a dirty yeah. joke? Are you going to tell us yeah. a dirty joke? Oh, please, oh, please. No, oh. but I'll tell you, whenever I, I got to save Governor Moffitt. And that's why I, I will go down in history by saying that I, I was able to save Governor Moffitt. We were going out, uh, Moffitt, we were going out to lunch when we were down in Florence for the Prison City um, study. And unfortunately, this guy, who it was a hot day, we are just finishing lunch and her security guard was leading us out of this restaurant that we had just had lunch. And in coming to the restaurant was this guy, he was carrying a gun and it was on his, on his hip. And oh. the security guards freaked out obviously and, and tackled this guy. And I pushed Governor Marford behind a refrigerator and I stood in front of her and I said, Governor, I got gotcha. you. I, I will. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my, um, and so she stood behind me until uh, the security guards got this guy under control. He, he, it was an accident. He didn't want to leave his gun in the car. He was no, the governor was not threatened in any way, but I was there to protect her. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, that's yeah. such a good story. Yeah, she was a gem, just a gem. I'm, we miss her. Um, yeah, no, I mean, the first time I met her was actually, I was doing, um, I was, when I was at the library, and I was doing a, a group meeting at the Bee Feeders. Oh, yeah. And I, I, mean, I had literally been in Arizona like a month. And oh, wow. so I run back to the library in South Phoenix, and I was like, going, oh, I saw this most fabulous woman with this big head of white hair. hair. And they're like, yeah. oh, that was former Governor Rose Mofford. I was like, oh. Yeah. And then I started reading yeah. about her and seeing how amazing she was. She is amazing. And you meet her one time, you introduce yourself, you tell you tell her your name. She will she would always remember it. No matter who you were, she would remember you by your your name and say hello to you. It's just, I mean, just she wound up becoming an amazing Rolodex. It's yeah. like, oh, yeah. Up and she would, okay. And you just tell them Rose sent you. Yeah. And that, <laughs> that open. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. She's a gem. <laughs> Indeed. All right. So, this one I think a lot of people will probably get wrong, but which was Arizona's first master plan community? And Clark. Yeah, up in the Verde Valley. You know, um, when that smelter was established, I think in, I want to say in like 1912 in Jerome. And Jerome was really a budding mining town. And um, the, it, it overflowed into Clarkdale, basically, and another smelt, smelter was developed there. Um, and I, I want to say that the how Clarkdale got its name was from um, a copper magnet from, I think it was Montana. His name was William Andrews Clark, and that's how Clarkdale got its name. And, uh -huh. and it was for the, the mining community. It became where like the the um, the bigwigs from the mine would live, and it became uh, it was. There's actually a a town plan from the early 1900s of Clarkdale still, 
at how it laid out the community and did that the community park around the development around the park in the center of the town and everything. Oh, that is so interesting. So I mean, in some ways, almost like Warren down by Bisbee, where right. it was kind of this community right. that was really designed for the the management of the mine, not just the work. Correct. Correct. Exactly. But exactly. oh my gosh, I mean, they've got that amazing copper museum, which is so much fun right. to go through because they, yes. I mean, they bring in the whole international aspect of copper that came from Arizona. Yeah, so. strong history, and so many communities in Arizona really developed around that mining heritage. Right. All right. Arizona is home to two of the largest municipal parks in the country. And where are they? Phoenix and Scottsdale. We're, we are so lucky to have those two incredible parks in our state. And the, the leaders that and the citizens that supported the development of those two parks are, are tremendous. Um, when you think about great cities around the world, they all have great parks as a, a, a monument to the community. And we're lucky to have those two um, in our state. Well, yeah, I mean, and I didn't realize less than like a hundred acres actually separates the two of them from being fourth and fifth. Yeah. Which I, was interesting. I, I was, I always assumed just because I visit South Mountain Park more that it was larger and it is by a little bit, but I was shocked it was such a small amount. I didn't realize right. that the South Norton Preserve was that large. Right. Yeah. They're incredible, incredible parks. Yeah. I mean, I love how with like South Mountain Park, you can go down and they will do like stargazing walks. You can mm -hmm. go bike riding. You can get up close and personal with some petroglyphs. I mean, it really right. is a way to get out of the city while still being right in the middle of the city. And it goes back to the heritage of how we started this conversation about the City Beautiful movement and, and the movement in the 70s about environment and the conservation of natural resources, all a critical part of what urban planning is all about. How do we create spaces, cities that we interact within, not only with each other, with the built environment, but also with the natural environment. It's what makes great places that we wanna be a part of and the parks like these, as well as small parks that are scattered throughout our cities are such an important part of their urban planning. Right, and even and even to find these photos, I actually, I didn't realize Joan Faluda had written a book about how did the Mount McDowell Preserve become what it is. Yeah, So I look forward to seeing right? that, right, and just kind of seeing the politics that must have gone on to make that happen, I'm sure were fascinating. And even the South Mountain Preserve, if you begin to look at the history of how that got, actually got established, it's pretty amazing the history and dedication of people to make that happen. All right, and then we have our last question. Who, in Ari who is Arizona's most famous community planner? You know, we could debate this probably because actually everyone on that list has made contributions to um, Arizona's community planning effort. Um, Governor Bruce Babbitt was tremendous in what he's done. Frank Lloyd Wright, obviously. Um, Paulo Soleri, I, I chose because he's internationally known, though he is an architect, um, but he was the first one that really talked about how do you integrate design, architecture with ecology, and how do you begin to, to do that in such a way that leaves a small footprint. This whole concept of archeology, arch, arch, so to speak, um, was something that he created. And of course, Arco Santi, uh, which is outside of Phoenix, people come from all over the world to study there as well as to visit there. It was started in 1970 to kind of take his vision and put it in practice. And people still are trying to evolve that concept or that prototype of how we live and do it in a frugal, um, sensitive way and leave a small footprint. Yeah, I mean, I love being able to go visit Arco Sante. I mean, there's so many different festivals and events they do. 
Um, mm -hmm. I, I, sadly, by the time I get wind of what I want to go to, because they actually have a few rooms that, that guests right. can stay in. But right. by the time I find out, it's like, oh, I really want to go to that. It's like, oh, those are long booked. Yeah. So I guess yeah. I just need to book a nice weekend and say, hey, you know, I'm going to go to Arco Sani on this weekend and just go spend a day and or two. Yeah, and then go up and do wine tasting up in the Verde Valley afterwards. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much, Peggy, for being on. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your week? I know it's been kind of a task. I don't know if you want to talk about your tasting room or not. Yeah, thank you, Marshall. It's been a challenge. We have a, a, our tasting room for our winery, which our winery is in southeastern Arizona in the beautiful uh, Chiricahua Mountains. Talk about history. We have oh, a lot. Of gosh. Oh, I didn't realize that's where your vineyards were. Oh yeah, we're in the foothills at five thousand foot in the Chiricahua Mountains. So wow, really close to where Johnny Ringo was buried. <laughs> you can walk <laughs> from the vineyard. So um, it, yeah, it's gorgeous. But we have our tasting room, which is in Old Town Scottsdale, down by the waterfront, and um, beautiful location to taste wine. But our building, where we're located, is uh, going through some construction. Um, shoring up some reconstruction of that building so we've we've had to close it down hopefully only for a month or so they'll get the building back together and we'll be able to open up hopefully in october or november but um yeah but people can still contact us um, or get on the website and order wine and we'll deliver it to you and and you can enjoy some great arizona wine but yes it's been a challenging week <laughs> <laughs> and I, we're in the middle of harvest. So harvest. Oh, did, oh my gosh. I didn't realize it was harvest time. Yeah, it's harvest time. So Oh my gosh. Yeah, we're pulling in grapes uh um all last week, this week, and probably the next few weeks we'll be harvesting grapes. Wow, yeah. No, so hopefully we're trying to get um Callahan to come and talk about oh, good. So yeah, it's kind of that Arizona wine history. So still working with him on a date and things. So hopefully getting him to, because yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, talk about a local economy driver right there. Absolutely. You know, there are, there's three really thriving wine regions in the state of Arizona, the Verde Valley, down where Kent Galligan is in the Sonoida Elgin area, which is the oldest wine region. And then over where I am closer to Wilcox, though I'm an hour from Wilcox, but in that whole region. And Believe it or not, more grapes are grown in my region than any other region, though it's um, remote. Oh, oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I think like, I want to say like 75% of all the grapes in Arizona are grown in Cochise County. Oh, any wow. Yeah, yeah. Great water, great um, soils, cheaper land, obviously, and, right. and so a great climate for grape growing in that part of the state. Yeah. Very good. Well, again, Peggy, thank you so much for taking time out of your really crazy week as you've been driving all over the place. Yes. No, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Marshall, for what you do and, and keeping uh, Arizona history alive and, and in the forefront of people's minds. I think it's very, very important for people to understand where we all come from. And, and how to, right, exactly. And how we're going to survive. So that's yes, what all exactly. All right. Yeah. Well, I will let you probably take a good night's sleep that you're as well <laughs> deserved. <laughs> Thank you. And cheers to you. Indeed. Cheers. All right. Take care. You too. Uh, let's see. And then let's do that. So, you know, I mean, that is, I mean, I love that there is so much learning going on that even in the course of just these questions, these amazing stories, I mean, I love the fact that Peggy pushed Rose Mavard behind a refrigerator. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing all your stories and your amazing career and knowledge with us. So our next segment is called Little Arizona. As we get a chance to talk about small towns across Arizona. I mean, we all know you can go visit Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the country, Tucson, Bisbee. But, you know, what I think really adds that charm are some of those other cities. And so a little town that I've been to before that 
Naco. So just outside of Bisbee is this bedroom community of Naco that is basically, I mean, it's in Cochise County. It has just over a thousand residents that are there. And it's, I mean, literally you can park there and walk across the border into Naco, Mexico. So it really is one of those true border towns. Now, it initially was, oh, 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 okay. Before I forget, this is where we're going to use our sample for today is Arizona Place Names, because I thought this was kind of fascinating. I mean, I love the history that this book keeps up. So it was talked about how the word Naco was coined from the two last letters of Arizona and Mexico. But when somebody was actually pressed to actually talk about it, it was the first station on a line then for, for the called Southern Pacific of Mexico as the road was being built principally to reach the mines of Nacarizi, Nacazari, Nacazari, Mexico. So that's where Naco comes from. So I love how it's kind of like, I had heard that that was the last, the last two names of Mexico and Arizona, but it was actually named for a city in Mexico where it was leading to. So I thought that was fascinating. Now, Fort Naco was originally built in 1917 as part of the Mexican border project. It was headquarters for the 1st Infantry Regiment of the Arizona National Guard. And then let's see, you know, let's make these a little bit bigger. And so these are some of those buildings still left. So from 1935 to 37, the Civilian Conservation Corps was based out of there. Then later on, the mayor of Oaxaca City agreed to take over the site. And by 2010, some of the barracks and the fort that still stands had partially been restored. And then in 2018, the city of Bisbee took over that area. So I love that bit of history that I didn't, I, I mean, I knew a little bit about, but then what I thought was really interesting was it was famous for being attacked from the air. An accidental 1929 bombing of Naco is noted for being the only and the first instance where a town in the continental U.S. was bombed by an aircraft working for a foreign power. It was an Irish gentleman and accidentally some bombs fell out. And so, and this was a car that was actually demolished by one of those falling bombs. Now, the original reason why I know NACO is because of the golf course, as well as, so not that I'm a golfer, but there was a great little restaurant that we would go to for breakfast every time we were in Bisbee. We'd zip over to Naco for breakfast. Now, it had the longest running, contiguous, continuously running golf course. First established in 1908. Um, there were buildings that were there that actually were originally built on a golf course in Bisbee but were then relocated to the Naco, to the Turquoise Valley Golf Course. And so those buildings were moved, um, but I did find out it was sold. Um, it's currently closed down. They've talked about reopening it after a huge renovation. So we can only hope that indeed that does happen. So, because it was such a beautiful place and such a quirky place. I mean, the restaurant was really, it was kind of, it was a country club. I mean, that was initially, I think, how the even golf course got started was for that town of Warren, kind of like Clarkdale, where a lot of the management from the mines, it's like the wives didn't want to live right next to things that were pumping all this pollution. So they lived a bit further away. So that way they could have their nicer homes and actually wear white and not get it blackened. And so this was kind of the origins of the golf course. And so I hope 
that they are indeed true to their word and still plan on doing a nice remodel of that and keeping it beautiful and open for all of us. Now, please, if you have questions, stories, suggestions, or comments, I mean, feel free to put them in the comments as well, as well as suggestion comments, feel free to reach out. Now, next week, I'm so excited because we are talking about the mother road, the road of dreams, Route 66, and the Jackalope Trading Post that is family owned and still run and so famous for that here it is. So we will have them coming on and chanting to chance where we can actually talk about Route 66 as well as the history of the Jackalope Trading Post. So that's going to be a lot of fun as well. Again, I want to say thank you to all of you. Again, I could not be doing this without you because otherwise, well, I still would be doing it, but it would just be for me. I'd just be talking to myself in my house, which people would think I was crazy, but they think that anyway, but that's okay. So every little bit helps. So thank you all so much for those donations. Um, you can see Venmo at the very top of the screen there. You can track me there. I've actually had people send me a check. So anything is welcomed. So thank you all so much for that. Also, I do want to say that we do have support from AARP Arizona, and they like to say that the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we are not alone. AARP is here in Arizona providing information that can help you and your family. To find out more information about their programming and other information that can help you, take a look at aarp.org slash Arizona. So I do want to say thank you for helping me put this together. I do have Cole, Travis, as well as Chris Allen, who put together that great little intro video. And, you know, our amazing cocktail advisor, who I think knocked it out of the park this week and makes cocktails that you can, I mean, zip off to the Valley Ho and either enjoy it there or you can bring home a kit and make it right in the privacy of your own house which I've never made anything that complicated before. I'm usually kind of a wimp. It's like three ingredients and I'm done. But the whole egg whites thing, now, you know, it's like, okay, so I am vegetarian. There are other options. You can also use um, chickpea water. You can shake that up and get a froth as well. So I love the fact that there are options that you can do with this. But again, PJ, thank you so much for hitting a home run and knocking it out of the park. So please feel free to reach out, ask questions, um, share stories. Because again, as I say, most of my best stuff actually comes from people saying, hey, you know, what about this? So thank you all so much. And if you want to reach out, there is how you can reach out to me. And I want to wish you all a very safe and healthy weekend. Thank you all so much for being here and have a great night. Now I've got my little outro video. The outro music is actually Mr. Ho who grew up in Sunny Slope and is now on the East Coast with his own Orgestratica. And they have several albums out that you can locate. So without any further ado, and then it's also some, some found film footage that we may not necessarily know who the people are which I think is kind of fun. Um, the intro is actually, the beginning of that is actually from an event that we did at the Clarendon years ago called Artel, where we took the, every room, we took a bunch of rooms and an artist was given to each room. And so I took one room and turned it into a kind of a slide exhibition because I have a whole fascination with film, slides, those personal documentations of Arizona history. So thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate you all and have a great rest of your night.